Okay, I'm going to talk about um, things hopefully in a way that slightly wraps up um, what everybody else has been talking about uh, as well. There's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of uh, relevance. Um, we, we're all uh, tapping kind of, uh, dabbling with similar sort of themes um, as designers, as architects. Um, maybe they could be called even trends, but lighting is certainly developing in, in uh, quite an interesting way at the moment, as you can see. Uh, Mickey is now staring at me. Okay. Mickey, it's like a one eye that's got a purple eye. I'm not sure I'm going to... I was going to get one of these for my kids, but I don't know. I can't stop staring at it. Okay. Right. What does lighting designer do? What is lighting design now? Fantastic question. Entirely up to you. I feel this way. I've been working 15 years. Um, uh, as was said, I'm from Finland, but my uh, professional life has always been elsewhere. Um, I started off from Scotland, moved down to England. All my work during that time was pretty much outside of those countries. Uh, now I'm based in Madrid and all of our work is outside Spain. You might have seen in the news that Spain is not um, economically the best place to, to be, but it is uh, the best place to live right now, in my opinion. So it's very international work, and that has given me a very kind of, um, uh, I think, a, a, a very, I'm very grateful of this position that he has given me because I can really observe. Um, and it has made me even more um, aware of context because I'm not really working in, in most of the time in my own context, if you like. You have to become an analyst. You have to become a strategist. Um, and from there on, we can list now a thousand things that lighting designer is or can be. It's entirely up to you. So during those 15 years, what I've seen is that lighting design has started to become extremely creative. Um, it's still technical. But because we are in this threshold moment now where certain kind of technologies are entering the architectural lighting market, I'm all the time, by the way, talking about architectural lighting. I'm an architectural lighting designer. We do permanent lighting pieces. We don't do any theater. We don't do um, light festivals. It's permanent work. This is permanent work. Um, so this, this technology that's entering now from essentially show industry, where it's been kind of available for about 20 years, with it is coming ways of expressing and using light um, that have also been present in entertainment and theatre industry for about 100 years. Um, it's giving us this, this urban stage. A little, little like earlier the uh, scenographer guy was talking about very interestingly, is that you know, it, it is an urban scenography um, and therefore it opens up a new roles for you. What is lighting design now? Good question. Is it scenography? Is it scenography in an urban context? Um, what is it? Is it a technical discipline? Is it an art? Um, again, entirely up to you. Um, one thing that I have learned is that projects like this means that lighting design is multidisciplinary. Lighting designer can't be a, a technical specialist anymore, but it's also very difficult to be successful if lighting designer is an artist only. Um, you need to be a philosopher, maybe you need to be a poet. You need to be an engineer, you need to be a calculating machine, you need to be a salesman, you need to be a lot of things. Um, fair enough, probably no one is. So therefore you need a team around you. A studio can be, maybe a person can't be, but a studio can be. Um, and this is how I built my studio. Uh, it's called Light Design Collective because we work in a very collective way. We have people all over the world. We have a small sort of headquarters in Madrid. We have a studio in Helsinki. We have a girl in Singapore, a guy in Mexico. And so it goes. And with it, that's the inner ring. Outer ring is even bigger. So it's collaborative, multidisciplinary work, if you want it to be. Um, this is a project that pretty much is another example of what we've seen before today. Um, we did this in Baku, in Azerbaijan. Where the building becomes, in the, with a very simple gesture, building becomes a communicator. It's a line of flight, it's an outline, which is there 360 days a year, completely static and completely white. Maybe when the sunset time is, it's a bit warmer. But when there's something that's culturally relevant in that particular context, a high day, then the building wakes up. It becomes an empathetic, sympathetic 
a device in a city, an object that says, hey, I belong here, I can only be here. You know, we, we did uh, crazy effects there, like fire cascading down the, uh, down the edges of the building to celebrate Novorus. The, the, the spring festival, where the second Thursday of every March is the day of fire. On that Thursday, fire starts coming down the building. For you and me, we go there, we see a fancy little lighting effect. What the hell is that? But for them, they understand completely what it's all about. It belongs to their context. And at the same time, it's an extremely simple little gesture, and theatrical, and fun. I think, I hope you will see in my work that we're not necessarily the most serious kind of guys. So we, we do try to insert a you know, level of fun into our, our daily lives. And we have this very nice and poetic approach, which is basically that, you know, when the sun goes down, it's up to all of us. It's, it's up to us as a design community to design the visual world, design it again. The nature is not doing it anymore for us. There can be a million views, subjective views, what that world should be, which is fine. But nevertheless, we do have to do it in order to maintain life as we like to live it. But what is that world? And indeed, are we happy with the visual world that's now being created, where we actually live now, um, for the hours of darkness? Is that the ideal world? Is that how we like it? I don't know. Certain parts of it I certainly don't like. This is an example of a project where we're trying to respond to a context in an abstracted way. So this is closer to maybe art. We were asked to do a piece uh, for my old school in, in northern Finland. This is 100 kilometers below Arctic Circle. This is where I grew up. That's the building where I went to school. And I can tell you it was the most weirdest moment in my life to walk back to my old school as some kind of uh, international artist. Um, but what this piece tries to do is when you see that that little time lapse on the left. In my home city, there is what I would call a time of light. There is no, um, you can't say that if it's day, that there is light. You can't say if it's night, that that means darkness. In this city, it doesn't work like that. Um, in June, July, there is six to eight weeks when the sun doesn't go down. It's completely sun shining the whole night. It's light during the night. Um, equally, in winter time, there is about six weeks when you don't see the sun. So during the day, it's pitch black. The kids go to school, it's pitch black. They play outside, it's pitch black. They go home, it's pitch black. It's just dark all the time. So this light piece is trying to respond to the time of light in this context. But it's also trying to respond to the function of the building. So it's an active piece. But it's abstracted. So it becomes a beautiful thing that always lives. Um, this is an example of our work where the only way to achieve something like this is for us to write software. So nowadays, I run a line design practice and I employ probably as many nerds typing C++ as I do lighting designers or architects. This is maybe an example in an urban context, again, reinterpreting a little bit. Uh, this is not a radical project, but, uh, but it, it shows a little approach. Uh, that's an area in London that we worked on Regent's Place. That's kind of how it feels during the day. And at night, it begins to sort of shift a little bit, not dramatically. It's the same kind of feeling to it. It's recognizable. But then something happens. An object essentially appears, something that was completely um, dark steel art piece during the day, becomes a warm lantern during the night, and indeed becomes the light source for the area. So there's, uh, there's no street lights, you can see. There's no bollards, there's no street lights, there's nothing. There's just a, a reflective large lantern as an art piece. Um, and immediately you create a memory, you create a refer reference point, talking point. Um, and this is also a shelter that people can use, so you can walk into it. This is a work by an architectural practice called Carmody Croke uh, from London. It's another example of different roles that light begins to nowadays have in urban context. So, there is the functional that everybody's been talking about. It's, I suppose we can't get away with it very quickly. Um, but then there's things like branding and this memory creation, these sort of like touch points, uh, emotional touch points, uh, give area an identity. This is a, um, a, sm a small master plan we're working on in, in Helsinki called Kala Satama. And for that, the accent color of the entire project is this kind of warm yellowish amber. 
so the lighting begins to take a form of it. One big focal point here was underside of the bridges. Underside of the bridges are usually pretty damn um, terrible places, but they're of course for light designers, great places to work because they're so rubbish that anything you do will look better. You know, why, why have hard life? But one thing that you don't see in this image, which is to me the most interesting part, is that right at the back, you see those little like yellow dots? That's the point where, uh, where the sea comes in, the real sea is just there. And there's a timber deck, and over that timber deck, we're putting like, kind of like chandeliers. And that timber deck becomes a tango stage. In Finland, we dance more tango than Argentinians. And we drink more coffee than anybody else. We also drink a lot of vodka, like you do here. So I love you. Come and talk to me later with some. So this, this one is, is an expression of trying to tap into, again, to the context, of, co of course, be a little bit humorous about it. And then a big eye-catching piece, so all this crazy stuff you see in the ceiling, is indeed a light sculpture that's bringing that seawater, metaphorically speaking, up, across the ceiling and down again. And it actually follows the real water movement, um, uh, when it freezes over, which it, which, which it does, the texture changes and so on and so forth. It follows the wave patterns and so it becomes like a real, uh, again, an abstracted art piece that has some relevance to the, to the real context. Time is a big design tool for us. Um, again, that was mentioned a little bit earlier as well, is that with a flick of a switch something can, ha can happen. The, you know, light has this really instant relationship with time, which I'm, I'm very interested of. Um, when you have light festivals, or in indeed any kind of shows, you, you do this. You follow a dramaturgic curve, so it's tension over time. Um, you have a starting point, middle point, and the, and the ending. Um, this is a Hollywood movie, or any theatre stage, this is a thousands of years old idea. We didn't exactly invent this. But what we thought would be interesting to apply this to a permanent context, which means there's a light show, but there's not always a light show. If it's always a light show, it's like too much ice cream. You know, you just get a headache. Um, and, and as a lighting designer, to me, the most amazing, amazing thing about light is the fact that you can switch it off. You can't switch off architecture or interior design or, you know, or any object until we get the invisibility cloak, which I'm still waiting from Harry Potter, the objects remain, but the light disappears. It has this unbelievable magical quality to disappear. It's, it's great. So this is a stadium where we thought we could uh, apply this idea. Um, the architectural con concept was diamond in the desert, um, and we would apply a dramaturgic curve to the functions inside this particular stadium. It's going to be part of the World Cup in 2022, so there'll be football, and football is full of drama. So it's easy. You know, the light begins to live with the drama of the football. Um, equally, there can be a Madonna concert there, or athletic competition, or whatever. They all have the dramatic curve. Um, and the lighting will respond to that, follow that in real time, all the time when there's an event. So in a normal evening, it's a diamond in the desert. Basically what you see is a little bit of flickering of white light, hardly anything but something, so it's an expression, um, but not disturbing. But then an event starts, now, now it kicks off. So now what's happening is that the guys with, the, with uh, blue shirts are attacking from left to right, so you're actually, um, in an abstracted way, capable of following the game. There are presets for the colors, so, you know, if it's a Brazil against Finland, if you look in this case, and Finland is winning, Brazil just got the uh, yeah, red card, um, and nobody in Doha, you know, will have any doubt what's going on. So you'll be able to follow it, but these patterns are not pre-recorded. They're all the time created in real time through processing. There's no video clips. Um, now the tension grows, and somebody scores. So the building becomes this sort of playful communicator. It's a media facade, but it's not media facade that has a soap powder ad on it. It's not media facade that has Coca-Cola ad on it. In fact, we've designed it in such a way that when Coca-Cola wants to buy this, they can't, because they won't be able to hack into the system. I'll tell you a little bit later how it works. <laughs> and so it goes. So the, the, the game is const constantly followed, patterns are constantly created, nothing ever repeats, and that's because the client had a brief for us. They said, okay, this building will be, will be ready 2016, but 2022, when the World Cup is here, it needs to look completely new, absolutely man fantastic, uh, something you've never seen before. 
So we had to hide all the technology and come up with a way of controlling it that stops repetition. And this is the, our answer for it. Uh, it's based on technology created in Barcelona called Reactable. It's essentially haptic computing. So you have the game projected onto a glass table and with physical blocks, you're, you're slamming them on top of the game. You know, Messi is attacking from left to right. You, you flick a um, cube over Messi and twist and the entire facade will react to that. If somebody scores, you twist something else, something else will happen. But it's a pixel perfect system, which means you can never repeat what you just did because you can never get the block exactly where it was before. So the next night, you doing the show, is going to be completely different. So this is not somebody, something that a lighting technician will sit behind and press buttons and, you know, go, you know, it's always the same. No, thank you. You cannot repeat what you want. So the human error is an integral part of this. We're capitalizing on, on human error. When we showed this to the uh, client, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Ahmul uh, he absolutely loved it. And it turns out that this is actually going to be like a VIP device now because they're all crazy about football. So they're not going to let any technicians use this. They're going to use it. So when you're there watching a game, it's literally going to be the Sheikh himself twisting these, <laughs> these cubes. And, you know, God, we hope it works because, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure he knows where we live. Here's another example of what lighting designer nowadays ends up doing. We were asked by Samsung to do um, a feature wall for a pop-up shop. And this is our proposal. So we, thought we extend it really high up. We make a really eye-catching device, but uh, abstracted enough so it doesn't look like a video screen. Very low resolution. There's a beautiful movement of white light mixed with blue. You know, they're kind of corporate colors and blah, blah, blah. And the white flares are based on the density of people in the shop. So there's this sort of typical uh, interactive element to it. Um, very simple to achieve nowadays. We did two different uh, options, one entirely indirect, one partly indirect, partly direct. And we sent it out and we were very pleased with ourselves. And we thought, you know, they're going to piss in their pants. They're going to love it. Well, the guy called back and said, Mr. Tapia, thank you very much. Your proposal was absolutely fantastic, but it's got nothing to do with what we want. Um, we actually want this. Big guys in Samsung said that you can do your light wall, but it has to be done with Samsung devices. So it has to be tablets, um, smartphones, whatever, and you can have your video running on it on your, or your processing software running on it or whatever you want. Well, there's a little problem here. There's 150 of them and they're all computers. You can't hook them up. They're not monitors, they're computers. You can't sync them up like that. They just won't work. Plus, we had four days to do this. It was literally going up. So, oh shit, you know, what are we going to do now? So, as light designers, we ended up being app designers. Everybody does apps, apps are cool, whole life is an app. You can probably get a girlfriend as an app nowadays, or mother in law in Japan. Um, so, we wrote an app in a couple of days, which is basically a device on an app that creates white light that shifts very slowly into blue. But the clever bit was that there's this. There's this like a bug in it that randomizes the code all the time. So when it does this shift, next time it does the shift, it does something different. And then it does something different again. And it does something different again. All 150 devices have this same app running at the same time. But because of this randomizing bug, it means that they will just, they'll never do the same thing all the time. Uh, it, again, it cannot repeat. And the end result is a feature light wall that does these waves of white light and blue light in a randomized, beautiful, abstracted way. Um, but no one's controlling it. There's no interaction. There's no code as such. It's just doing its own thing. So it's 150 independent lighting devices. So we turn these laptops or whatever they are, um, smartphones, into lamps. But it's unusual. You know, we, I never thought we would end up writing apps. Well, that takes us into then one of our favorite subjects, which is living light. So what we've been talking about, things like, you know, haptic computing, controlling this and doing that, and we're still controlling the light somehow. We're somehow being the, the guards um, of the water system designers who kind of know what's going to happen. But we thought, what if we could use the light in a way that we really don't, so the light actually has a life of its own? Like in nature, I always use the same quotation, but you know, 
I heard this uh, interview by Brian Eno, and he was talking about ambient music and how ambient music is for him. He's the inventor of ambient music. And he said, as an experience, it's like sitting by the river, watching the river go by. You can watch it the whole day. You don't get bored with it. But the river doesn't have a start or beginning or the center point or chorus or a B part. It's always recognizable, but it's always different. So there's a lot of complexity in the movement, and somehow it's fascinating. We try to figure out what the hell that is, and if we could actually bring that um, into our work. And this is one example where we're trying to do this. This is a crazy project called Ava Island, um, also known as the Water Cube. It's a floating uh, diving stage. So it's where um, diving will become a spectator sport. So during the day, the skin, the facade, becomes this ever rippling surface, which is essentially is a mirror arrangement that we've designed. So we designed the whole facade. Um, it has a pattern that creates sun, uh, of shadows from the sun, and then it ripples and reflects its surroundings. So it should be very beautiful, very much kind of blending into its uh, surroundings. At night, it becomes very dynamic. And the light movement um, is designed in such a way that it's artificial intelligence that mimics the behavior of a swarm of fish. So uh, the light behaves like fish. So we don't quite know what the light's going to do. But what we do know is that it again tries to respond to his context. Of course, in a very theatrical, fantastic way. This needs to draw attention to itself. The whole idea is that tourists will take boats and go there in their thousands and see nighttime underwater shows. There's this big stage with a water cube in the middle of it. Uh, inside and it's literally floating. At the moment, the client is talking to a Greek shipbuilder and they're gonna build 100 of these. <laughs> so, coming to a lake near you, <laughs> a water cube with a fish swimming in front of it. Um, anyway, so these are, these are the attempts, but again, it means that it, it is a, it's a piece of software doing its own thing. Um, and we're not putting video clips, we're not creating repetition. And we hope this sort of approach gives, gives longevity. Um, it becomes acceptable, it becomes the river you're watching. Um, it's not a representation um, in an exact way. Tying into that, um, there is a new area being built at the moment in Helsinki called Kruunvuoren Ranta. Can you repeat that, please? <laughs> Kruunvuoren Ranta. Um, What's amazing about it is that it will be called the District of Light. So there's nothing there at the moment. It's a huge area. There'll be 11,000 people living there. But at the moment, it looks something like this. So it's an old oil depot. All those tanks have been taken out except one. And it will be turned into a new district that's branded and given identity through light. And there's a lighting master plan that's been done by uh, Spears and Major in West 8 from, uh, from Holland and UK. Um, and it, that kind of creates the framework for this sort of artistic light interventions um, everywhere in this district. In the next 15 years, every single square meter that's developed for this area, the developer needs to invest 10 euros per square meter towards light art. We're talking about one and a half million square meters. That's, that's done. So now you understand why I just opened an office in Helsinki. <laughs> and we're already working there a lot. So it's absolutely amazing. I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is, I don't think this has happened anywhere in the world. And the first project that was, uh, was built for this was like the flagship, in a way, to say that the whole world and Helsinki, uh, people in Helsinki, that here's the new area. It's going to be a district of light. Um, come and have a look at it. It was a silo 468. So this is a project we've won through a competition. Um, this is a view of this new area uh, from the central Helsinki. This is the center park of Helsinki, very natural environment. Um, it's, it's this sort of experience when you're there. It's very windy. Uh, Helsinki is the city of winds. Um, and you're very connected to the water. You're very connected to your surroundings when you're there. So about three kilometers away from the center, we were told that it has to be visible at least three kilometers or more in the beginning, because remember, in the beginning, there's nothing there. It will take 15 years to build. So it's just this one little dot lonely there they need to sort of emit the message to the whole city and say you know something's happening here but equally it needs to be something where you can walk in um, and experience locally so it looked like this very pretty 
um, to the rusty pot. And the, apart from the, you know, it needs to be a light art piece, that was the brief, it was that, okay, you need to cut some holes into it so the air comes through and there needs to be a door and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it was a very loose brief. Uh, beautiful, uh, inside it was absolutely beautiful, beautiful rust, which unfortunately we couldn't keep because it was toxic. Um, and outside it had this rust pattern. We took that rust pattern and we um, abstracted it into a whole pattern using all sorts of weird techniques like um, algorithms and such. Uh, we did a very careful uh, daylight study. So this, this became for us very much a daylight art piece. Um, so we, we looked how the sun actually behaves there and how it tracks the surface and we positioned the holes accordingly with the idea that you get this beautiful shadow pattern happening inside which then moves throughout the day. The interior we decided to paint, paint, paint deep red so we keep that old, old idea of rust and this kind of darkness. Darkness is a luxury nowadays. Darkness, darkness is, you have to be rich to afford darkness. So we thought this is public space so we give darkness for everybody for free. Helsinki, very socialist. Um, and we want the people to behave like this. You know, if you ever went to see the sun installation at Tate, that's how people behave there, me included. I was lying days and days there. Uh, the Olaf Aureliasson uh, piece. We wanted people to go there and just kind of let go, surrender, and just be there. Um, the daytime effect we wanted this, with this rippling effect during the day. So we positioned 450 steel mirrors uh, behind the holes. So wind uh, moves them, the windy city, and you, you get this sort of effect when the sun hits it. And I've actually seen it happening, it works. So there's a little mirror and there's a little test image. And it looks something like that. So from outside we wanted to paint it white so that it remains as a memory of an oil silo. We didn't want to do it pink or red or, you know, patterns on it in a sense that we want it to be absolutely recognizable, a memory, a memory of the past, um, but with a sort of contemporary twist. And during the night, the concept was then this. So we wanted this non-repetitive, natural, acceptable light movement, the river effect, but without the water. And we basically looked into swarm intelligence again, and this time with the way birds behave. And we, we started writing um, uh, software based around that, and we positioned LED dots behind the holes so that all the lighting is inside. So inside is indirect light, outside you see direct light. And every single light dot is a bird. How pretty. And the way they move is when the wind blows, certain speeds, certain whatever, it gets all the time real-time data. Wind blowing, you know, 18 meters per second. The system throws in artificial hawk into the software. So the birds see the hawk and they go, oh, shit, and they start flying in a certain way, the way, way the birds do. So we don't actually know what they do. So they, they do the bird thing. And, um, you know, we just look. Um, and that's how it looks in the software. So you end up with these quite beautiful, very abstract patterns. Nobody who sees it goes, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I get it. It's a bird. That's not the point. The point is the movement. So the movement is non-repetitive, somehow acceptable, because it doesn't look like some kind of a game from a petrol station that ding, 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 it doesn't do that. It's flowing, it's unpredictable, it never does the same thing twice, um, it disappears, it appears, it does all sorts of things, so it becomes acceptable. Um, this was just a, a method for us achieving that. It's not representing anything. That's the code. Read it carefully. I'm going to ask questions later. <laughs> Again, you're sleeping, you're sleeping, okay. Not long now. Um, and that's the expression of nighttime. So we added some flat lighting outside uh, because we were scared that the whole thing will disappear and that the birds will not be enough. Uh, turned out that we didn't really need them, but hey, um, we did that anyway and that these are some of the renderings. And then it's, you know, the building started, some guy cut the holes. There's 2012 holes exactly because it was the design capital year 2012 project, so this is the memory, and people can go there and count the holes and, you know, have an amazing day. Um, here's a little video. Let me try to get the music connected. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm just pouring water over somebody's computer. <laughs> can you hear music? 
the point of the music is that it, it was actually recorded inside the silo. So this is the acoustic world inside that silo, which is pretty amazing. So here you see the LED dot. It's only warm white. We didn't introduce any color. That's the mirror. And that was really the the inspiration, which was then translated into the software. It took one year roughly to realize because the whole silo had to be sandblasted and then painted three times inside and outside because of the seaside con conditions. It's, it's a very brutal environment. This is Finland. I mean, it's minus 25 during the winter, plus 35 during the summer, very saline. And you're getting the shadow pattern. That's me going, oh my god. These are test rigs that we did in the office. And a little anecdote for any city representatives here who are thinking of ordering a massive art piece from us. The budget for this piece was 1.8 million euros out of which the lighting, remember this is a light art piece, the lighting represented 100,000. Who says lighting is expensive? Sandblasting is very expensive, as is painting, it turns out. But the lighting was the smallest uh, cost of the whole project. These are the hippies that you hear in the background. Oh. Yeah, that was the opening. So for the opening we lit it red outside. And now there's the program is such that at midnight the exterior turns red for one hour. Apart from that, it's always white or off the flat lighting. You see the indirect reflected light? And then from outside, you're looking straight into it. So these are now visible roughly about 10 kilometers away. I know it because I saw it from the airplane. And it's constantly monitoring the wind speeds the wind direction and temperature and if it's snowing or not. Um, when it snows in Helsinki, the software introduces a parameter that says it, um, gravity is 100%. So the bird is trying to fly, but it can't because the gravity is 100% and it pushes it down. So the birds are start dropping down from the sky and it looks like, um, it looks like it's snowing. You know, for the kids. We are currently making a movie out of this. In fact, we've been making a movie out of this project for two years, which will be hopefully launched at the Media Facade Summit in um, Frankfurt next April. So come and check it out. So here's a few pictures. That's how it looks during the day. And this is a time lapse from inside with the sun. So it's very much a sort of daylight manipulating device, some kind of sundial. And then at night is something like this. And with a long exposure, it looks great.
But it is an example of a project where a lighting designer now is really starting to wear quite few hats. So going back to this sort of collaborative, collective, multidisciplinary thing that we're now becoming, um, lighting design is now digital. Um, it's software writing, it's app writing, it's uh, analyzing, it's strategist work, it's anything you want it to be. Light is becoming a really quite flexible tool. Um, technology is driving that, but uh, it's our responsibility as a, as a, as a community of designers um, to basically step ahead of the technological development and really grab the meaning of use of light um, and the emotional values of it and begin to use it um, in a new and exciting way. Thank you very much.